Welcome to episode 288 of the DFO Rundown, brought to you by Botano.ca. The game starts here. And man, this week, you got lots of options. NHL, of course, you have uh, March Madness down to the Sweet 16. Uh, NBA, and heck, you like uh, F1, maybe. Maybe you think uh, Max could lose two in a row. Check it out at Botano.ca. I'm Jason Greger. He is uh, Frank Sarah Valley and uh, Frank, we got lots of start. Hey, let's talk about uh, milestones. I'm always a big fan of them. Uh, we now have two new additions to the uh, 50 goal club as both uh, Sam Reinhardt and Zach Hyman uh, lock it in. And uh, I don't know what the odds would have been at Batano at the start of the season for either one of those guys scoring 50, but I'm guessing it would have been good if you picked it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it was on the board. I mean, <laughs> Zach Hyman's previous career high was 36 last year. He Felt like he blasted that by January. And Sam Reinhardt, I mean, another really consistent goal scorer, pencil him in for 30 and 30 every year, but not sure anyone really saw 50 plus coming. No, and it's, uh, I'll say it right now. I think those two guys uh, would be the uh, the leading front runners to be uh, Canadians' uh, right wingers at the upcoming uh, Four Nations Cup next year. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd be I'd have a hard time envisioning a team Canada without either one of those two guys. No, um, solid players and in, in what they do. And um, you know, I, I will say it's you know, there's a lot of people like oh Hyman just plays with with McDavid, and I, I I'm always curious why people try to want to put down a player for reaching a really lofty milestone, and uh, you don't just score 50 by playing with McDavid because I can give you the list of players who have played with McDavid. Some of them could score 20, for God's sakes. So Yeah, what's that, with that? Why do people try and knock players and seasons down a peg? Yeah, I don't, like, I don't get it. So, so the first thing that I heard with Zach Hyman sort of emanating out of Toronto was, oh, well, he just plays with Connor McDavid. And then the next thing was, Oh, but he's shooting 20%. And it's a preposterous, absolutely preposterous comparison. But what Zach Hyman is doing this year is like Shaq and his high shooting percentages with the Lakers. The reason why his percentage was so high because he was dunking the ball every possession, it felt like. Yeah. That's kind of what Zach Hyman is doing from, from that close in when it comes to his scoring around the net. I mean, it's if you want to have a field day, just pull up NHL Edge and some of the statistics there with Zach Hyman and, and the goal scoring that he's done to this point in the season. I mean, it's, it's actually comical when you look at the shot chart. Right, so he, from he, high, high just, I'll just read this, this stat from, for you. From high danger, which is the closest area around the net yeah. think like crease and not even halfway to the circles okay he's got 41 goals of his 50 are from that area the league average is five <laughs> 41 goals and out of 500 and some forwards the league average is five no yeah. He's 99th percentile in shots on goal from that area. Goals. The funny thing about his shooting percentage is he's only 81st percentile in shooting percentage from that area, meaning players get to that area and get shots and score 19% better. Some of them do than him. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. He scored a different and a lot of different ways. He's got 17 wrist shot goals, 10 backhand goals. He's tipped in pucks eight times. Uh, deflections four times, which is, you know, a little bit different than a tip in. Um, he's got four snapshots. He does actually have one slap shot goal, uh, a wrap around, and then he batted one in out of midair. Like he scores different ways. Uh, and the thing is, I had a conversation with him. And when he came to Edmonton, if you look, it's been a progression. He went from 21 to 27 to 36. And now, you know, whatever he's going to be 50 plus. And it it's really... I think a good example for any player out there, Zach Hyman says, I know how many I'm shots on goal does he have total? How many shots on goal does he have total this year? Um, 249. Do you know that only 38 of them are above 70 miles an hour? Oh, he's below. Yeah, he he's below 50th percentile in almost every other shooting category. Distance, speed, 
you know, even his skating speed, it's good, but it's not, it's not otherworldly. Yeah. He's, he's somewhere between 70th and 77th percentile in speeds and speed bursts. Like Zach Hyman is the closest to the NHL every man that we could get. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, when I talk to him, he says, hey, I know what I'm good at. So he worked really hard the last few summers on getting better around the net. I, I think a lot of people don't understand. Like, you got to have quick hands. You got to read the play. You got to be able to make good plays in tight around goalies. You know, Deacon battle out defensemen, get good position. It's not just standing there because of 97. And the funny thing is, if, if people are like, out of Toronto, well, Zach Hyman has a 20.1% shooting percentage. Austin Matthews has 19.6, you donkeys. Like, guess yeah, but what? if it were that easy just standing there, Zach Cassian would have done it and would still be doing it. Well, uh, and, and Pat Maroon and Jesse Pugliarvi and Kyler Yamamoto. Heck, who's the other winger on that line predominantly? Ryan Nugent Hopkins. How many goals does he have? Like, it, I, I never understand the need to disparage a guy. Zach Hyman has figured out, like Ryan Smith told me many years ago, there's bags of money in front of the net if you want to go get them. And it's hard to go to the front of the net and then be good at it, right? Like, you got to go there. You have to have good hands. You have to have good instincts. You got to read the play. There's lots of elements. And to me, there's, you know, there's lots of things you could look at and kids, Hey, everybody, you want to be McDavid, but you're not going to be McDavid, but guess what? You, you would have a better chance to be Zach Hyman. If you want to have an absolutely relentless work ethic, right? That's what like, he works incredibly hard. He's really strong in the puck. He works at the things he's like, I'm not a transporter of the puck, right? I'm not out there. I'm not feathering passes. That's not what I work on. He works on his skating to get better. He works on getting stronger. And then he works on being very good in tight. And if you look at Sam Reinhardt, now he's a little bit different of a 50 goal scorer because there's not just one way to score goals, right? There's lots of different ways to do it. And it's funny for Matthews, who's an absolute sniper to Reinhardt, who's a little bit of a mixture. And then you got Hyman, who's a guy who's right around the crease. And guess what? They're all three 50 goal scorers, all from different areas, right? Like Matthews scores the most from farther out. Right, not, not that much farther even. And then Reinhardt's a little bit in between. And then Hyman, of course, is uh, the majority, as you said, Frank, 41, right from uh, right from the wheelhouse. And guess what? Go there and go there consistently, and you'll have a better chance of being rewarded, but no guarantees, as you've outlined with a lot of the other guys who get lots of shots from there but aren't getting as many goals. But that's why I was saying he's the closest to the NHL every man as there is. And it wasn't, again, it's not a knock. It's actually praise in that, there's no one like the skill with your hands and vision and knowing when to get there is key, but there's no incredible size advantage. There's no um, incredible skating or speed advantage that he has over others. It's work and it's knowing thyself, know thy, know yourself, know your game. And that is I think it's a lesson that's incredibly powerful, not just for Zach Hyman and other players that are are coming through the ranks, but also any kid that's listening, if there are any, um, to say like, he, you know, Zach Hyman had mentioned this past week, especially in the stop through Toronto. Hey, you know, I, I wasn't always the best kid on my minor hockey team. No, you know, probably was cut at varying points. Definitely wasn't the biggest, didn't have the most, uh, you know, touted stock in terms of being a prospect. Sometimes hard work above all can, can get you places. No, hundred percent. Yeah. So no, good for, uh, good for Hyman. I think it's, uh, you know, good for Reinhardt. What a, what a season he's having in Florida. What a season the Panthers are having and they're in a dog fight. And, you know, that's, what's kind of great here. The, the playoff race, you know, there's a little bit of a race, I guess, for uh, for you know the the wild card and third place in the, in the Metro still. But the the big races are really at the top of the divisions. Florida and Boston tied with 97 points. Florida has a game in hand. Rangers, Carolina separated by one point. Rangers have a game in hand and they're ahead. Um, you know, then you look at the Central, Colorado and Dallas battling back and forth. Uh, Winnipeg's uh, three game losing streak and suddenly they're four points back. Right, uh, the only race really is in Vancouver. I think with Edmonton losing both their games on the weekend, uh, they're ten back. They got uh, thirteen games to to eleven. Like you know, I would say that race for first place is done uh, for sure. So um, there are races still. Like Edmonton's not a hundred percent. They're fairly comfortable in in second place. But uh, you know, home ice advantage, man. That these final few weeks of the season, Frank, is going to be some great races for home ice. 
there's great races for just about everything. Home ice, first seed in the conference, president's trophy. I mean, there's really not a race no. yet that's decided. Uh, there's not even a matchup, really, that's locked in, I think, because it could just as easily be Rangers and Flyers as it could Hurricanes and Flyers. Yep. I think the only position Toronto. that really seems to be firmly locked in is Toronto and third in the Atlantic. Although Tampa's suddenly four points behind them. So even that Yeah, one, but the Leafs have a game in hand. I mean, yeah. I'd say that's the closest one to being locked in. Yeah, then probably. The next Edmonton's closest one would probably be the Jets in third in the Central. Yeah, well, Edmonton's three up on LA and they got two games in and one game in hand. So that's as close as Toronto pretty much. But the other one that's that very quietly the Nashville Predators, it's a big, you know, the odds aren't great, but suddenly they're five back of Winnipeg. They have been, they're the hottest team in the NHL now for last month. And uh, you know what? They're, they're closing the gap. Like that's, um, although like if, if you're finishing, if you're Winnipeg and you're third, you're playing Dallas or Colorado. And, and if you're uh, fourth, I think it's the worst playing- spot you could be in. I think that's the most dreadful yes. position entering the playoffs is trying to avoid third in the central. Well, I'll say Toronto's not in an easier spot either because you got Florida and Boston, right? Like you beat one, then you got to probably face the other one. Yeah, and and look, I like Winnipeg. I just, I don't know that I'd pick Winnipeg over either of those two teams. And especially not after the way Colorado's playing. Did you see that game on Sunday? Well, they just sleep, they slept, walked through 40 minutes and then decided to wake up, yeah. Well, by the way, the pens were were pretty good for a while, and that yeah. would be probably infuriating if you're a Penguins fan, only to see the end result and be like, yeah, okay, that's more in line with what I thought. But that Avs team, they just have the ability to grind you down and take over. They lead the league in comeback wins. I mean, down 4 nothing and winning 5-4 is bananas. Yeah. And the McKinnon point streak continues. 34 points, 34 games, uh, a point in every game at home so far this season. Now second all-time, longest streak. His individual point streak, this is his second 18-gamer of the season, which is bananas. Has, it's too, it's, it's too early. Not He hasn't locked up the scoring race, but is there a chance that he's locked up the heart? Who, McKinnon? Yeah. I don't think so. And and here's why. It's a good question, Frank. So Nikita Kucherov, first of all, is ahead of him in points. Kucherov is like, you know, 43 points ahead of his next teammate in, in Braden Point, who's a pretty good player. And I know a lot of people are like, yeah, but look at Kucherov's five-on-five five goals against. And I'm like, okay. So I dug into it. Um, McKinnon is, is 54 goals against. Kucherov is 67. And uh, McDavid's 51. All right. But if you actually look at five-on-five five shots against, McKinnon's 574, Kucherov's 583. Is it really? That's nine different shots, right? Scoring chances against 515 for McKinnon, 522 for Kucherov. Is he really that bad defensively, or is he not getting saves? Because uh, his on ice save percentage is 885, McKinnon's is 906, right? If you look at even high danger chances, there's a few more 33 to 27. Right, high danger goals against. Like it, the the goal. If you just look at goals for yes, but then you've got to dig a little bit deeper. And so, no, I don't think it's a, it's a lock for McKinnon at all. I think I think it's uh, those two. McDavid's going to be hard pressed, I think, to to catch either one of them. But McKinnon and Kucherov are closer than you think when you go by the wording of the rule, right? And and most valuable to your team when you're 46 points ahead, and you know on his team. Well, the other guy, yeah, he's only a plus five at, at five on five. The other guys on their team are minus 15, minus 18. So it is showing you that they're still better. And he's not giving up many more shots than McKinnon when they're on the ice. The difference is the shots are going in. Right? Yeah, and that's right. and that's not really on the, that's not like Kucherov. And anybody's tracked it will tell you that, you know, um, forwards have, you know, quite a l- less impact on goals against uh, five on five. Rantanen's going to cruise past 100 points. He actually plays about 20 seconds more a night than McKinnon. Yes. Does 
now this is just purely I'm, I'm pulling this question out of my ass so forgive me but I'm just looking at the two and their numbers side by side McKinnon and Kucherov does the fact that McKinnon plays more than a minute per night more than Kucherov does that matter at all it sounds funny to say, but over an 82-game season, one minute more a night is 82 minutes. That's four mm -hmm. additional full games that McKinnon is spending on the ice than Kucherov. Four yeah, I'd, I'd additional have, I'd have full to look games. at it. So, so I'm looking at the at their minutes um, uh, at five on five, and McKinnon's at 11.98. So you know, Kut now Kucherov's played one fewer game, right? So so that that'll factor in a little bit, and he's about 50 or 60 minutes right now. Uh, less five on five, it gets a little bit more power play time, uh, per game. So, you know, it's not a it, it's 60 a minutes that becomes by the end of the season, 10 more games that's going to be 72 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's uh, if you play 20 minutes a night, that's three and a half, three and some full games, three and a half full games. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I think maybe we're splitting hairs at that point. I don't know. No, I'm just saying, I'd never no. thought of it before. I, I don't no. mean with these two, but I mean in general. Does, yeah, does like it, I, I voted lots, Frank. I never, I, that consideration more to, to the defenseman. I find sometimes you're a D man who's playing 27 minutes to a guy who's playing 24. Right. Um, I've never, but you know, this way, I think the race is a lot closer than people think like there's, you know, there's I fans mean, in Colorado. Be close. Like Kucherov has been outstanding. I'm not, yeah, I'm not discounting what he's done. I just watch the magic that it feels like McKinnon has night in and night out. Nine game winning goals. Kucherov has six. Beating him in even strength points, even strength goals. I don't know. He has 73 more shots on goal. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's close. Like I could see McKinnon winning. I wouldn't be shocked if he wins. Um, I don't I don't think it's now you, who knows? to answer my question, you're saying it's not locked up. I don't think it's a lock. No, I, I do think McKinnon, because of his style of play, he's more noticeable, right? When, when you watch the games, you know, his, his speed, how he attacks, you know, it stands out. There's no question. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you look at that, is it a knock at him that he's only 46% in the faceoff circle, right? Like, you know, so there are, we can, we can always nitpick at things if we want on the players, but I, I think, I mean, you know, Kucherov's a winger, so what, like, if you're yeah. going to bring the face-off part into it and comparing the two, like, I don't know. Is it really no, You're just looking at responsibilities of the player, right? Um, right. Kucherov's actually 50%, funny enough. He just doesn't take many face-offs. But um, the, uh, when, when I look at McKinnon, I, I, I do think some people like, well, and this isn't me, and I, I, I would never, I think it's disrespectful to vote based on, well, this guy hasn't won. I only yeah, I, I agree. I, that drives me crazy. Yes. This, uh, this narrative that you go into a season, and I feel like it happens more with the Norris than other trophies. It's like, oh, well, this guy is due. Is due? Garbage. No, Get out of just, here. You earn it. it. If they have the best year, then they should win. It's and not a narrative-based award. Yeah. It's six, six, if he's the best defenseman every year, he should win. There shouldn't be a, well, you know, it's not a participation ribbon. It's not, guess what? If you're not worthy of it, then you don't get it. It's that simple. And to me, I, I what happened last year is irrelevant. What happened two years ago is irrelevant for when you're voting. At least 100%. it should, it, it is for me. I don't, I don't take in consideration anything in the past. I couldn't right? agree with you more. And, and as you know, head of the professional hockey writers association who helps determine the voting list, it drives me crazy to hear people talk like that publicly. No, that's well, he, that's a dereliction of duty as a voter. If that's yes. what you're thinking about, yeah, like I take it very serious. I look at every possible, and 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 then I'll say it's very when you have to rank like this year. If McKinnon's one on my list or Kucherov's one on my list, it's not like it's one and then there's a map. There's been other years where there's a massive gap. Like when McDavid had 100 points in 56 games, that was pretty easy. But this year. You can flip flop back and forth, and you can make an argument. You can make an art. I know there's people out there at Rangers saying, "What about Artemi Panarin?" Right? And people in Boston. Oh, I think Panarin's a good Boston argument. Right? I, there's it, other guys. If you're actually going on full wording of the rule of the the trophy in most valuable to his team, if if you are a literal, there's there's two different camps of voters. Are you a literal voter or are you an M? You know. 
do you think they're just the most valuable player in the league, meaning the best player? Yeah. There's two different ways to think about it. I think if you are a literal voter, I think you're probably going Kucherov one, Panarin two, because what you would make in terms of an argument is, hey, I know he's 26 points back, but Rantanen has had a hell of a season in Colorado. And, you know, maybe he carries a bulk, a, a share of the weight in terms of wh what the abs do and accomplish. I, I'm just, I'm playing devil's advocate just to, to voice the, the other side potentially. And then yeah. you might be, you might be able to make a Pasternak argument. You might be able to make a, for a team that struggled to score for a long stretch of time, a Connor Hellebuck argument. There's, there's lots of different ways to look at it. I tend to try and not look at it literally. I tend to try and blend the two thoughts together. Yeah. And I, you know, that's why I have so many different voters and people are going to, not everybody has to see it exactly the same. If they um, did, if they did, why would we vote? Yeah. It's kind of boring, but to me, I just, I don't, the one thing that really annoys me is when I hear people, well, he deserved, he earned it. He, you know, he's due. What? You're not due. It's supposed to be a really hard award to win. This is not a participation ribbon where it's like, well, he's been in the league a long time. So he deserves one. Give me a break. That's not what that's, I don't see that anywhere in the wording that's like most valuable to your team. And if they have yet to win, they really should get extra consideration. It's not in there. No, that's insane. Yeah. So shouldn't be, but it's a hell of a race. And, you know, McKinnon and Kucherov, Panarin's had very quietly, I think, um, because the other guy's seasons are so good. Panarin probably gets overlooked, but he's, you know what? The, he, and he's doing stuff that he's never done before. Like he's chasing 50 here. He's never been a huge goal scorer, no. per se. And he's, he's 30 points ahead of his next teammate in points. And, you know, he's probably going to finish with 110 at least. So yeah, Panarin's had an unreal season as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, it's, there's lots of good candidates this year. It's, it's, it's exciting. You know, like sometimes it's boring if it's just one clear cut winner. Right. Um, I, I think the heart might be, if you look like one through five, it'll be interesting to see how people rank them and the different rankings. Like you could make an argument as you outlined, Frank, somebody uh, might have Panera. And if you had Panera number two, I could see how you could make an argument to defend your opinion. And that's what it's all about. It's like, how can you defend it to what point? And just because someone disagrees with you because they're a super fan, well, great, but they're a super fan and they have a bias, right? You well, and to someone's going to be bias. making the Austin Matthews argument. However many goals he scores, someone's going to yeah. be making that case. Well, that's and I, someone I is, is rightfully, I think, going to make the Connor Hellebuck case. I don't think he's going to win, but I think he should. I think he really deserves consideration to be in the top five. Yeah, he might get some votes, and he might get some fifth place votes, right? I think well, I might be have hard pressed. Be hard pressed. Some might, some might have him higher, right? It's a. Uh, it'll be fun. I, he's he's squarely in the running for me for somewhere between third and fifth. Yeah, oh, could be six, like, but he's some he's in that mix. And the funny thing is, you know, though how you rank those other guys could impact it. Like if if the first place votes are split in any form, then the, the next votes become highly highly important. And that's why I try not to even just you know. Now it's different for Selkies and Lady Bing. Sometimes, like I'll be honest, the Lady Bing's the hardest trophy to vote for. Um, it's you know, it's very difficult. I think for years, defenseman got grossly overlooked. It's it's a much harder position to play to be sportsman like, right? And not we, take penalties and all those sorts of things. But that's we're a tough cut one. from the same cloth on that. Yeah, it's a tough one to vote for. Like, I've been I, voting I, for for defensemen for the last five six years. Yeah, they they make up the bulk of my my top five. Yeah, so like, I'll say this: Austin, Austin Matthews, Matthews like, with four a lot of votes. Minutes all yeah. season it you know he's going to deserve consideration yeah when you play that many minutes and you find a way and by the way you're you have the puck lots and you're engaged in the game and other guys are taking runs at you like you you know what you're, you're doing something right there's no question about it let me, so. let me let me give you a uh made up award because i don't think that this falls in the masterton category but who would be your comeback player of the year this year oh god um hmm come back player good question um hmm i don't really know um i might go with uh um you know what who am i i might go with matt barzell if we're just talking guy who's kind of got his career back to where it was from many years ago 
He would he would get he would get some looks for me. Victor Hedman's a good one. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's had a really bad yeah, yeah, he's had an unreal year. It's a good one. It's been a while since Barzell. Like, remember Barzell at 85 points, right? And people thought, okay, this guy was gonna be unreal. And he hasn't been a point of game player since. And now he's above a point of game. So now some would argue that'd be a fun debate. I mean, there's lots of candidates. There's oh, always God. some some good goalie candidates too. Well, yeah, the goalie position's crazy how it goes up and down, right? Um, but yeah, Victor Hedman, that's a real good one. And then like the other one would be the breakout player, right? Who's because the breakout player, you know, you could have Reinhardt, you could have Hyman. No, um, no, no, no. They've been good players though. You need someone to me for breakout candidate, you have to be someone that really got to a different level. Well, 50 goals from 36, man. And and yeah, it's a jump, but it like Hy- but Hyman was already widely recognized as one of the best value deals in the league. Yeah, well, value deal doesn't necessarily mean you viewed him as a like nobody in their right mind would think Zach Hyman, who's on pace to score 55, actually maybe more goals, right? Like no chance. Like Austin Matthews scoring 60, no one's kind of everyone's like, oh yeah, that's not a surprise to me. Oh, another good comeback is Brock Besser. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of a breakout player. Um, Noah Dobson. Yeah. He's had a really good season. Gets overlooked a lot in Long Island. And you know what? He does it on a team I mean, that doesn't score. He's been a 50-point player the last couple of years. In fact, he's actually having a relative down year in goal scoring. In goals, yeah. Um, But he's I think he's cemented himself as, you know, obviously one of the upper echelon defensemen in the league. Um. Oh, another good comeback player is Matt Duchesne. That's a great one. Yeah. I mean, being bought out, signing in Dallas for little money relative, 62-point year in 70 games. Yeah. That's pretty damn good. What about Jonathan Drouin, boys? Hmm? Oh, Drouin's a great comeback player, too. That's unreal. His two goals that he scored on Sunday, including the OT winner. Special year. Now he's probably going to get 50 points. Right? I think he's got, yeah. what, 45 or 6? Something like that. So, now he's been a 50-point player, but it's been a while since he's a 50-point guy. So, yeah, it's good for him. And he, uh, well, what was it? What McKinnon's about, how about uh, Seth Jarvis as a breakout guy? He's got mm. 57 points in 72 games. He's kind of gotten to that next level. No. Yeah, he not, just not yeah, he's a league. younger guy. What's his third year in the league, right? So, I like Seth Jarvis, really good player. Um, How about Charlie I, Coyle? Well, I would say he is probably he's the player who has had to step up into the biggest role and fill the biggest shoes, no question. And he's done very well at it because they're everybody thought Boston was taking a step back because they lost their top two centers including people in Boston. Yeah, Charlie Coyle has filled that hole. Now, he's no Patrice Bergeron overall, right? But still, he has done a remarkable job. I might be the best one. I don't know. Well, here's another good breakout. Wyatt Johnson. Yeah, but is that a real breakout? Like, I thought it kind of broke out last year. People were like, man, where this Yeah, but a from? rookie can't be a breakout player. To me. Yeah, but if but if he had two good years, like he's kind of been the same player, like we saw him last year, no? Yeah, he's cl- he's close, but I think it's one thing to come in as a as a rookie that not many people are expecting a whole ton from you. You come in and you score twenty four goals, forty one points. Yeah. We always hear about the sophomore slump. He's taken on an additional minute and a half per game. Now playing seventeen per night. His face offs jumped as a center from 43% to 50%. He's already uh, beat last year's goal total by two with 10 games to play. And he has 13 more points and he's 20 years old. Yeah. He doesn't get nearly enough attention to be closing in on 30 and 30, which he's probably going to hit this year 
as a 20 year old center. I mean, what, how many, how many people do that? And what about the fact that in, and you know, who should get credit is the Dallas stars draft because he played seven games, his draft year, Frank. Oh. So now they did trade down from 15, but still they traded down and they took him. He played seven games for Canada that year. They traded they down to get him because they knew they could. They knew that no one was going to be, they felt like they were safe. Yeah. Well, people say that in hindsight, but you're, I can see if you trade down two, you trade down eight picks. That's a pretty big risk, right? I, is it though? He exactly what you said. He played seven games. How much of yeah. a risk was it? Well, there's lots of guys who didn't play because of COVID, right? So, but then they took like Logan Stan Colvin in the, in the second round that year. My, my God, those two picks. Draft Thomas is, Hardy at 18th uh, in 2019. Like the Dallas Stars head of amateur scouting, whose name escapes me right now, should be getting massive props. Massive props because that's a team that's being competitive and they're being able to retool. Not that they've gone anywhere, but they're bringing up young guys now who are who are becoming big. Like Thomas Hurley is a huge impact player on their team. Why Johnson? Stan Colvin is just, you know what? He's dominating the American League. Now he comes up. They're going to have room for him for sure. He's on the team. He's going to be there next year. Like that He's is got massive. 11 points in, in 14 games. Yes. And, and yes. they didn't even call up yet his running mate in Maverick Bork. Oh, I know. So yeah, who's like been Jason outstanding Robinson. north of a point per game in the AHL? Well, look at their 2017 class. You took high school. That's, in the, that's the best NHL draft class in history. One team in one single draft. I've gone through every one. It's better than the Red Wings ones. It's it, there is no team that has filled out the future of their roster with a, with checking all three positional boxes forward defense and goalie okay. in, well, in one go, draft you, like that if you go by all three yes however when you draft three hall of famers in your first three picks like edmonton did in 79 that's going to get you some consideration for sure right okay. and then what about when they took coffee curry and, and andy moog in 1980 would coffee curry and moog be better than ottinger um heiskanen and robertson Yes, probably. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, like those. But it's, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be really close yeah. because no. Ottinger is probably going to be significantly better than Moog. And I don't, you know, neither one of those players is coffee because there's only yeah. one. Robertson ain't Curry. No, but yeah. Haskinen's pretty damn good. Oh, I like Haskin a lot, but, you know, he's, uh, Paul Coffey's one of the, yeah. He's not the best offensive defenseman of all time. He's sec definitely second. So, um, yeah, but that, either, hey, the Dallas one in most recent years, no question. To, to do that, like you think about in five years, all the guys they've drafted in Dallas. It's unbelievable in what it does for them. Since 2000, like from 2017 to 2021, Heisken and Ottinger and Robertson. Um, Ty Della Andrew is not a bad player. Uh, you mentioned Maverick Bork, who isn't up yet, but is killing it. Wyatt Johnson, Logan Stan Coven. Like, oh my God. Like if no one else pans out, oh, and uh, Thomas Harley. If no one else pans out, they're still killing it. Like that's a, that's how you that's how you stay at the top and become a really good organization. And look, I, I mean, with all due respect to the Stars amateur scouting, it's to me it starts and ends with Jim Nil. Oh, Jim Nil, but he's always been a huge. But that's why they hired him. Amateur, he was, yeah, exactly. he was the highest paid assistant GM in the league in Detroit for a long period of time. And you can directly chart the Detroit Red Wings struggles since then with their inability to draft. Just look at the downturn in team since Jim Nil left in April 2013. Yeah. You you can chart you can chart it out on a line. I mean, look at his first draft in Dallas. Nachushkin and Dickinson were the two picks to start. 2014 was a little quiet. 2015, Gurianov, but then Rupe Hints at 49th overall. 2016, not a great class. We talked about 2017 murdering it. And since then, they're laughing. Yeah. They are laughing at everyone else. And uh, Joe, Mc Joe McDonald is the uh, director of amateur uh, scouting and has been for 11 years in Dallas. So I uh, give him a lot of props too. Yeah. I, again, I wasn't, I wasn't knocking him at all, but no, just no. saying in general, 
when you have an eye like Jim Nil does, you're gonna go. Your team's gonna go a long way. Let's bring in uh, Tyler Remchuk for an edition of Buy or Sell. What's going on, gentlemen? Back with another edition of Buy or Sell. And as always, it is delivered by our friends at DoorDash. 25% off and zero delivery fees on your first order of $15 or more. If you're in Canada, all you need to do is download the DoorDash app and enter that promo code NATION25. I got a handful here of buy or sell questions for you. Let's kick it off with that 50 goal score conversation you guys had at the beginning. If you had to buy on one of Reinhardt or Hyman to do it again in their careers, which player do you think would do it or is the more likely to do it jason oh god um man 50 gold is hard like i might sell on both honestly like i think it's so hard to do it again so i'm actually i'm probably gonna say i'm gonna sell on both i just and that's not a knock because i could easily see them score 40 but i think people underestimate and try i've looked it up a lot man scoring 50 goals is damn hard right really hard and now there is, we're in a stretch down the NHL where 50 goal scores are coming back. Cause for a long time, it was basically Ovechkin dry settle. And you know, Matthews, this is only a second time, right? Funny enough. Now he's going to get 60 both times, which is crazy, but it is difficult. So I'm going to, I'm going to say no, not because I think either is bad. I just think that's how hard it is. Uh, I'm going to go with Reinhardt. Um, he's been more consistently in the neighborhood, if that makes any sense. Uh, not nearly as close as 50. I mean, Hyman last year at 36, but um, to me, I think Heim, our, uh, Reinhardt being three years younger helps. It gives you more runway. I think in speaking to Sam directly, and I did a Frankly Speaking podcast with him earlier this year, um, he's figured out something playing with Alexander Barkov, not that Hyman hasn't with McDavid and the Oilers, but um, both of them, we were talking, we gave Hyman lots of props for his work around the net and we should. Um, the truth is that Reinhardt has been equally as good. And if you look at a, a map of their goal scoring, um, they're near mirror images of each other. Uh, the difference is that um, Reinhardt has scored a little bit more from distance. He's got like 12 goals that are from outside that inner slot, and and Hyman doesn't. Um, Hyman has 41 of his 50 from like literally right in front of the net. If you stretch it out a bit further, Reinhardt's got eight from outside of that. Uh, four from the right side of that. Like there's just, he has a different versatility to him that I think Hyman doesn't, not to say that both of them aren't repeatable, but I would bet on uh, Reinhardt before Hyman. Mm -hmm. so uh, I would one, actually bet on Hyman just because of how he plays with McDavid if I had a pick, but. Yeah, like if I was thinking about next season, like Hyman is still going to get all those minutes with McDavid. He's still going to get to park himself in front of the net on that power play. It's not like he's going to suddenly stop going to the difficult areas, right? So I think I might pick Hyman, but the argument for Reinhardt makes sense. Uh, next one I got for you guys. We didn't hit on this because it kind of came in between podcasts, but Tom Wilson, six-game suspension. You buying or selling on the league, giving him six games for his high stick, Frank? I'm buying. Um, he's not appealing it, to my knowledge, which... I think it just kind of lines up it. Like when I heard that six games, I was like, Oh, okay. Makes sense. Um, there's not really any way to defend it as a player. Your stick is the one thing that you are 100% in control of. Um, yes. I know that he doesn't have any stick infraction suspensions. Yes. I know that it's been since 2021 that his last suspension was, but he has a rap sheet. And I know he showed some remorse in the initial after, but that doesn't excuse you from what you did. You can run a stop sign and kill someone and you could be remorseful, but you still did it. Okay. Um, well, I actually, and I know this is my nephew who got uh, the stick in the oh, face, yeah. but uh, I talked to him about it. He does have uh uh, well, he already had a, a fake tooth, and so it was his fake tooth that got chipped again. So he's a little. He looked a little. 
I saw the Dumb and Dumber. He the the picture. He looked a little <laughs> like Lloyd Christmas. Yeah, it's too. So, but he sawed off. He said the good news was it didn't hurt as far as because you know when you chip your tooth if you've ever chipped your tooth and every time you touch it it's the worst. But he didn't have that because it was already fake. Um, I actually thought when I saw it I was like, well, that's probably going to be two games. I didn't think he'd get six to be honest. And uh, you know, I did talk to Noah. And he said, yeah, Wilson was was quite you know apologetic about it to, right away and afterwards. And you know, he watched the replay. It was like. Like obviously he did it. There's nothing you can say, but I, I was, I thought it was a little harsh to, to be honest. Um, I, I think it's probably his reputation for sure, but you know, and it, it's kind of like, what are you doing? I get it. I understand all of it, but I, I thought uh, it might be like a three gamer to be honest. Yeah. By I was the way, I had six. I was just going to say like the NHLPA has appealed these for sport. Almost the fact that they're not either, kind of gives you an indication that there's not really a clear argument to make no. that would would support knocking it down or they know that the appeal process is the biggest farce in the league so why waste your time but they've actually i think they've actually done a few of them just because of that to document no. for future cba exactly how the appeal process is broken that they've actually that's why i said for sport knowing that it's not likely to be successful that they've they've more or less done it just to be just to break their wagon and the fact that they're not in this case um isn't it says something to me yeah. you guys talked you guys talked earlier about nathan mckinnon in search of going 41 for 41 in terms of points on home ice we also have connor mcdavid looking to hit 100 assists are you buying on both of those milestones happening or are you selling on one of them jason well, McDavid's getting 100 assists. That's, I don't know, it's, it's, he needs nine assists in 13 games. Like, that's that's the easiest wager ever at this point. Um, McKinnon's streak, man, God, it's amazing what he's doing. It's, uh, I, I'd have to to look like, it's it's funny, he 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 kind of waited a little bit here lately. Um, and so you're like, well, if he did, wasn't going to do it now, then uh, maybe, maybe he's just going to run the table. It would be... Uh, it would be fantastic. He would join Gretzky as the only guys to go a full season and uh, getting a point in every home game, which is uh, pretty impressive. So I'm looking at the Avs and just seeing like who they have at home left. Um, and they're they're in a run now. They got Montreal, then they got the Rangers, and they got Nashville. Uh, I know they have the uh, uh, Oilers, Minnesota, Dallas. What, geez, they actually have a pretty tough home stand. With all the top teams, man. Um, you know what? Yeah, I'll say uh, I'll, yeah. I'll sell. Now. I think it might be hard. The the Winnipeg Jets are really hard to score against, so maybe it comes down to to, to that game. Frank, well, I'll buy on both. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, believe how hard their schedule is. McKinnon has gotten as close as like thirty seven seconds left in the game before getting a point. Yeah. They know it. He knows it. And maybe there's a game that happens for the best home team in the league over the final seven where they get shut out. Maybe. But even watching Sunday's game, I watched every second of it. Oddly enough, I wish I had the courage to break out the betting app on Botano and, uh, and, and bet the avs money line while they were down for nothing i felt like they were very much still in the game when it was for nothing and that's not revisionist history or patting myself on the back like there was something about the way that they play they're never really out of it so um i i think he's the mcdavid one is a foregone conclusion to me the mckinnon one my only question about it is will we actually consider it the record because he has 41 and Gretzky will have 40. There was only an 80 game season then. And he had a point in all 40 home games that you can't, you don't, you can't take the record away from Gretzky because he didn't have one additional home game, right? He scored in every game possible. Yeah. How many? 100%. Yeah, no, it's, it's the same thing. It'd be a tie. It's not going to be a new record. It's like you go the whole season. If you only have 80 games, you only have 80 games. The league, the league is grown. That's you can't take away a player. Gretzky didn't have a chance to, to play a 41st home game. So yeah, of but course. somewhere some clown 25 years from now is going to look at that and say, Oh, Mc, McKinnon's the record holder. Mm -hmm. And it's like, nobody, they actually played 80 games then. Yes. 
All right, there you go. It's like Jeff. in '93, when and when they had the, the '84 game seasons, right? No one says, "Oh, you scored 100 points in '84 games, you don't get 100 points." Yeah. All right, that is a wrap on this week's edition of Buy or Sell, delivered by Dor. And uh, how about the fact this will be the first time it looks like since 1993 that uh, you'll have three players with 130 points in the season because uh, Kucherov, McKinnon, and McDavid are all on pace for 100. And, and 30 points right now, which is nuts. Um, you know, the, the, the art, we, we talk about the heart, which is really close. What about the art Ross, man? That is, uh, that's a hell of a race. Kucherov with 123, McKinnon with 122, uh, McDavid with 117. And he has games. He has two games in hand on both of those guys. So uh, Kucherov and McKinnon each have 11 games remaining. And uh, McDavid has 13. And uh, that that's one that's not voted on. Um, obviously McKinnon owns the tiebreaker right now in goals. And uh, I think the last time there was the tie that was broken was Gretzky's rookie year when Marcel Dion and him each had 137 points, but uh, Dion won the Art Ross because he had more goals. Mm -hmm. Like, God, that would be it. That's, you know what, when people say, oh, someone's due for it, it's like, hey, guess what? You got to have a tiebreaker and that's what it is. So uh, right now McKinnon has the advantage in that one if there's a tie. So can I get you to put on your chef hat and white coat for a second? I want you to play Chef Gregor. All right. And as we get close to the end of the season here, 10, 11, 12 games left, depending on what team you are. Yeah. Unless you're the Oilers, you have 13, which sounds like a positive, but isn't really because there's only the same number of days remaining for everyone. I want you to cook up the most chaotic matchups like rooted on pure chaos realistically what are the most chaotic first like what's your most chaotic first round bracket that you can come up with okay well i'm gonna have uh boston and toronto for sure and uh then i'm gonna have the rangers winning the um eastern conference so that means florida will play tampa so now i got two big rivals and they stay within their division so i like that um, the Rangers will then take on the uh, will take on Ovi and the Capitals. Or sorry, no, they will actually take on the Islanders because the Islanders are going to catch the Flyers. The Flyers are out. It'll be Ovi and what? the Hurricanes. Yeah, hey, just the Islanders are going to catch the Flyers. They're six points back, and they've shown I, no the game in hand. I know. Hey, you said create the most chaotic one, so that's the one because now you have Rangers Islanders rivalry. I said realistic. They, I didn't say take mushrooms and do this. Hey, dude, I, I are you that confident in the Flyers? Like, I don't know. There's, the Islanders, they, I agree. Okay, so look look at the Flyers' week. They beat the Bruins. They yeah. beat the Leafs, and they took the canes to ot does that look like a team that's falling apart to you no doesn't to me but the capitals are going to catch them so either way it's going to be washington versus uh, kuznetsov in carolina and then i guess the rangers i guess maybe we'll go rangers and um and flyers that's still uh that's still a, a decent rivalry so and then in the uh, in the west i'm going to have well if i'm looking at pure chaos it's got to be golden knights oilers right um, so yeah, they catch LA. Yes. hundred percent. Um, and then Vancouver is going to, uh, take on Vancouver is going to win the, uh, the West. So they're going to take on, uh, LA. And, uh, then you have, I want to see Colorado against Dallas is max. Yes. Chaos. Winnipeg's got to finish. Winnipeg somehow catches both of them. And then they play Nashville and Colorado plays Dallas. I know that's the, that's one's unlikely a bit because the way Colorado's going but Colorado well, one week ago round. that wasn't that was very oh, likely it looked very likely yes because so. Winnipeg was in the driver's seat in the central and they yes. had a really tough week and by the way if you were betting on a caps comeback on Sunday against the caps oof that did not look good no i thought for sure they'd bounce back after a rough one and they were they just didn't have it I will say, surprisingly, Colorado, like they got Montreal, they'll beat them. But after that, they play the Rangers, Nashville. They play Edmonton twice. They play Dallas. They play Winnipeg. And they play the Wild, who have actually been pretty competitive here. And I know they got a really low chance, but Colorado might have one of the toughest schedules down the stretch. And maybe that opens the door 
for uh, for Winnipeg to catch. I don't know, man. They've won I, nine I agree. in a row. It's, it's unlikely. They're, the the abs are cooking with gas right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was I would uh, bet on the abs to win the West right now, regardless of what their schedule looks like. Yeah. I still think Vancouver's gonna get it. That'd Vancouver had a little they had a little bit of a dip, and I think now they're uh they're coming back up. And I really think they want it too. I think Rick Tockett. Um, you know, he'll you find different ways. There's all the motivate. incentive in the world. To oh, win are you kidding me? There's massive, right? Because if you believe that you can get to the third round and you're Vancouver and there's no reason to believe they can't, then you're going to have home ice. That is massive. But it would be amazing if the Islanders, let's be honest, if the Islanders can get in and play the Rangers and then you have Florida, Tampa, Boston, and uh, Toronto, that's unreal matchups for rivalries, man. Like that would be, that would be ideal. I know it's very unlikely that the uh, the Islanders get in. I understand that, and and I probably don't really want them in. I just they're a boring team for me. Sorry, Islander fans. I know, you know what, uh, very passionate group, and I love it. But your team is meh to me. You know what's Frankie? Not meh? No, uh, you know what? Yeah, what is it's it? Man, daily face-off the, uh, survivor pool. That is uh, decidedly not meh. And guess what? The only thing sweeter than victory is starting your day with the new Cinnabon pull apart from Wendy's. Frank's goal now is to get a weekly prize and to win. So you can have this, the Cinnabon pull apart from Wendy's as a daily face off for giving the chance to win weekly prizes all season long. Sign up today at dailyfaceoff.com sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app and uh, get in today. Get uh, your first one. I sucked on uh, last Monday. It's it's annoying when you can't even get through Monday. I will admit, like I'm just it like, sucks. come on, at least. Yeah, it's brutal. I'm going uh, with uh, Canucks over Kings to kick off my week. Ooh, and, yeah, like it's uh, no joke. They don't. There's no freebies. I will say that. Like they don't give you no. any freebies in the Wendy Survivor. Like it's not like okay, here's the layup one of the week. There's never you any. Could take, you could take that Cinnabon pull apart though and just glue it right to my ass. Like it is just, I, I, I if I get one, I would need six orders of them. Oh, God, I know I that's know. problematic for me, but that's just reality. Oh, dude, I'd be all over it. So you're taking Vancouver to win, eh? Hmm. I mean, it's just straight up win Vancouver. I mean, yeah, you got on home ice. I, there's no, they've won three in a row. There's no reason to not. It's not like they yeah. need to win by two. Yeah, I might be going Quentin Byfield for getting a point. Okay. No. It's either that one or... I, well, I got to look into the... That block shot one always intrigues me. How many shots is Vancouver blocking every game? So, so I'll look into that. We'll see. Frankie, have yourself a, a good week. There's... Uh, man, there's lots of games on tap this week. I'm quite excited. The Tuesday nighter, obviously, is a, is a busy nights. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays have become the, uh, the go-to nights in the NHL, but... Um, the playoff race, man, there's lots of, there are some teams still telling you they have a chance, right? St. Louis is still kicking around thinking that maybe they got a chance. It's obviously very low. Um, the Islanders pretty low. What about the Detroit Red Wings, man? That would be an absolute gas job if they don't make it in. Well, they'll find a way. So they're going to beat out Washington. I, I think so. What? You're just telling I, me how you're all up on the flyers. Did you see who the capitals have beat? I, I see. I, I didn't say I'm all up on the Flyers. I just said, does that look like a team that's going to wobble? And we have nothing to point to yet to say that they will. We've got tons to point to for the Caps to say that they can. I know they've got a game in hand and they're one point up. I If I'm just looking at both of those teams again on paper, I'm still picking the wings. Well, hey, buddy, what a huge game tomorrow night. That's the game of the week, baby. Washington at home to uh, to Detroit. That might decide it. I mean, honestly. Yeah. It's going to be, it will go a long way. That's a four point game. Oh, it's a huge game. Huge game. And just, you know, I don't care who wins. I just don't want it to be a three point game. Let me just say uh, it's the worst. <laughs> it, it's the worst. Everybody have a great week. We will chat with you later.